So, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, my name is Suya. Uh, I'm an undergraduate student from Mungi, and uh, I'm actually graduating this May. So, um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about student class competitions with CentOS. Uh, so, actually, I met uh, Mr. Bowen uh, last June uh, yeah. in, in, in Frankfurt. And then we met again uh, in November at Denver. Yeah. So uh, that's how I get in touch with him. And uh, yeah. So let's let's get started. Um, so is is there anyone here uh, working in like HPC? Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, today I'll be introducing the student class competition to you. So just a brief description of what this is all about. Um, and then I'll share a little bit of our team's history at the past events. And um, yeah, so since this is a SimPass event, so in the end, I'll talk a little bit about system uh, management in HPC and how it differs from like managing a web server or something. Um, okay, so uh, student cluster competition is an event where you form a team of like five or six students, um, and then you are required to build a computing cluster um, that's under the three thousand watt power constraint. So you're not limited by the budget you have, but you're limited by the power you can you can use. So that's uh, fair to all the teams. Um, and then what happens is that they'll give you some scientific applications and benchmarks. So like, uh, you know, chemistry, physics and all that. And uh, you're going to study these applications, see how they work best, and try to design your cluster so that it's optimized for the workload that you'll be running um, during the competition. And then you're just uh, spending like a few months um, before the competition, just trying to, your best to understand what the applications are actually computing, like the, the theory behind the applications. And also try to learn uh, like how to optimize it, or you can even like change the code if you want. So that, that's, that's an, uh, entirely up to the teams. Um, and then during the events, uh, you will set up the cluster. So you have like two days to set up the cluster. And then you will have like two to three days where you're going to run some workloads on these applications that are given by the committee at the beginning of the competition. Um, so there are three major competitions uh, around the world. Uh, the first one is Asia Supercomputing Challenge. Uh, we call it ASC. So this one is in China. I think it started in 2012 or something. Um, at first, it was like a national competition, but later a lot of the international teams are actually participating in it. So I think this year they have like 300 or something teams for the prelim the preliminary round. And then the final round has 20 teams that are going to go on site. And compete. Um, and then the second one is the HPC, the ISC student class competition. So this is uh, organized by the HPC Advisory Council together with the ISC conference. So this one is in um, Germany. In well, I mean, for the past three years, it's in Frankfurt, but they used to host in other places as well. Uh, and this one is in June. And the last one is actually uh, the supercomputing student class competition. So this one is in the States, um, held during the supercomputing conference. Uh, yeah. So these are the three uh, competitions that uh, like we should go to. And uh, I mean, there are similar concepts, like what I described just now, all this for these. Uh, but they all have some like unique aspects. So, for example, for ASC, it's like uh, it's very hardcore. So they usually give you a ton of workload that they didn't expect you to finish within time. 
So the best you can do is that you plan accordingly. So depending on the, uh, the capacity of your server, you see how much score you can get within the limited time uh, for those workloads. And um, another very uh, exciting thing is that you actually got to work on the late, uh, fastest supercomputer. So in 2016, it was the uh, Tianhe 2, which is back then was the number one in the top 500 list. And uh, starting from 2017, they moved to the uh, Sunway Tango Light system, which is now the fastest uh, on the list. Yeah, so it's very, I mean, it's very precious uh, opportunity to work on the actual like fastest supercomputer. Yeah. Um, and actually, in 2017, they hosted the event at that uh, supercomputer center. So yeah, that that was very exciting. Um, and then for the second one in Germany, this one is more relaxed, I think. So they usually give you like just maybe one workload for each application, and it can finish like um, in minutes. So although the like the the competition is like from 10 a.m. to like maybe uh, 4 p.m. But actually, you you can just use like less than one hour to finish. And then they actually suggest you to talk to the other teams, like make friends with them, and also attend the conference. So this is during the conference, so you get to actually visit a lot of the company booth or even attend some talks if you want. Yeah. And um, another very interesting thing about this is that they used to have this um, secret application. And the aim is that you try to finish this within, say, one hour, but with the lowest possible power consumption. So usually we compete by measuring the runtime. Um, but in this particular case, you're actually measured by the power consumption. So essentially, you're trying to make it as slow as possible within that one hour. And uh, you're free to remove any hardware. So maybe um, at first you have like 10 machines. Then you think, OK, maybe this one is enough. So you can power off the nine, uh, I mean the rest of the nine servers, and just use that one. Um, so it's really up to the team to decide um, how many servers they're going to keep, um, uh, I mean, powered off for this. So actually in 2016, there was a team from South Africa. Uh, they finished the application in like 59 minutes. And their power consumption is like a straight line. So it never changes and it's the lowest among all the teams. So they were really good at this. Yeah. Um, and then for the last one, um, I guess the most, um, uh, I mean, what's the most different from this one and the other two is that this is uh, almost 48 hour non-stop competition. So for the up, so for the first two, like you get to go back to the hotel at night, right? And then you start in the morning the next day. But for the third one, you just keep working. Um, and I mean, of course you're free to go back. Like nobody's stopping you from doing that. But a lot of the teams, they stay uh, overnight at the competition. Um, yeah, so it was a very exhausting uh, thing. So like, I think I slept for maybe five, six hours over like three days. So it was very crazy. And they also have some new elements like power shutoff. So what's gonna happen is that they'll shut off the power at random time by themselves. So you don't know when when the power is going to go off. And what actually happened uh, last year in November is that they cut the power at 4.30 a.m. So I was at the competition site, I was very tired, and then suddenly all the server just stops. So previously it was very noisy, like all the fans were spinning, but suddenly like it was so quiet. And yeah, so it was a surprise to us. And then we are tasked to reboot the server and try to recover what we were competing previously, so you get to do things like checkpointing and all that. Otherwise, you lose like all the work you've done. Yeah. So that's that's something very interesting about this. Um, 
And then a little bit about our team's history. So our team actually was uh, formed in 2014. So I mean, I wasn't in that team. Uh, I joined in 2016. So it was formed in 2014, aiming for the ASC competition. So back then, our team was focused on the ASC competition. Um, the reason is that in ASC, they provide a service because the sponsor is actually one of the manufacturer of service. So you can request as many servers you want. Um, so essentially, you're just paying the uh, air tickets on yourself. So that's easier for the team to join. Um, and then from 2016, after I joined, actually our team tried to attend the other two as well. So for the past two years, we've been going to IRC and SC as well. Uh, and then now, I think all the students from our group are like doing science and engineering, mostly computer science. We try to get some people studying like physics or math on board, but so far like we don't really have uh, a lot of students doing that. And um, so we actually won some awards back then. Um, the first time we went to the competition, we won the silver award. Um, and then uh, in 2015, we won the highest impact. So impact is the benchmark that is used to rank the top, uh, top 500 list. And uh, this is a pretty standard benchmark in all of the competitions. So yeah, so we, so we got the highest impact back then. And uh, in 2016, we got the application innovation awards, which is, uh, I mean, the first in one of the applications. Um, and then our biggest win is in 2017. So at ISC 17, we won the Deep Learning Excellence Award. So there, there was a challenge where you were given some captured images, and then you have to train a neural network to detect the letters and uh, numbers in it. Um, yeah, so we get the highest accuracy on that. Um, so we got that award. And then in 20, uh, and then in SC 17, uh, we actually get the overall champion. And uh, as well as the high school camp. Yeah. So that was very exciting back then. Um, so, so why do we uh, love these kind of competitions? I mean, there are other competitions like uh, ACM, ICPC, uh, Programming Challenge. Um, but I think what's so special about this is that it tests you from, uh, I mean, it tests you on many things. So, First of all, of course, you have to have enough technical knowledge about the domain, uh, like for example, geophysics or uh, molecular dynamics, weather forecasting, all these science. And you also have, have to have enough knowledge about computer itself. So um, like operating system, uh, networking, uh, compiler, these are all related to this company. And also, you need to have some soft skills. So during the competition, you need to present to the judges. Uh, you're going to have interviews, and you're going to design posters. So all of these, like, you have to um, pay attention to these because these all accounts for the final um, score. So you have to have good presentation, uh, communication skills, and also you have to plan well, uh, especially for the essay competition because. It's a non-stop competition. Um, they'll give you everything at the beginning, so you have to decide when to run which application, so that you can finish everything within the time limit. Yeah. So you have to plan really well, and you have to plan for any unexpected events that you can think of. Yeah. So um, yeah. So the last thing I want to talk about is uh, system uh, administration in HPC. So. Uh, is there anyone working as a, like, a system administrator? Or are you like more on the developer side? Okay. Yeah, so um, so actually system uh, in HPC, I think, is um, very different from what you'll be doing if you're like working in an internet company and then you're deploying like uh, websites or web services. Uh, so, I mean, first of all, this is very important for the competition 
you need to have a stable system, of course. Otherwise, like uh, nobody can work on the computers. And then um, the challenge here that we faced at the beginning is that there's limited information available online because, like, there are a lot of systems working in various uh, supercomputer centers around the world, but like. Like they don't usually write blocks or post anything about how they actually deploy the system. Uh, so what you usually find online is about deploying like web servers and all that. So this is the first challenge that we face. So we don't even know what we should install on the system. So we may know how to install the OS, but like for what service we should install? Like we basically have no idea. Um, so we have to start from scratch. And after like consulting some um, experts on this and also asking some advice from our seniors, um, this is actually like the kind of software stack that I summarized. So if we're de uh, deploying web servers, then probably you're dealing with like Apache or engines or uh, HA proxy for load balancing and then maybe MySQL for database and like Docker, Kubernetes, and all that. Um, but it's, complete, uh, it's completely different in HPC. So in HPC, first of all, you have to have a shared file system, which is, I think, not something you usually install for like web servers. Uh, so you can have like network file system, which is common in Linux, or you can have some more advanced like tools too. Uh, so you have to have a shared file system because uh, you're computing with a cluster, you need to share data among all the computers uh, in that cluster. And then you have to install various compilers. So I guess uh, you've used GCC before, but in fact, in HPC, we also use like Intel compilers and PGI and even some other compilers um, because like they have different performance, uh, different optimization techniques. So we have to try the best to uh, get the maximum amount of uh, power we can get from those optimizations. So we have to try like different compilers. Um, and we also have to install a lot of these like scientific computing libraries. Um, so the, the first one is MPI, which is for communication, so message passing. This is something very common and is uh, using a lot of the scientific applications. So this is something that we must install. And usually they depend on some libraries like uh, BLAST, which is basic uh, linear algebra routine, uh, subroutine. So they have a lot of like, uh, you know, vector times, vector matrix times, matrix, those kind of functions that are so common to a lot of the applications. So uh, this is also a library we install. And then we have things like HDF5. This is a file format. Um, so you can store like arrays in the file uh, in binary format. Um, and then we have CUDA. So if you're running any GPU uh, code, then you have to install this. And there are also a lot more, uh, I would say, application specific. So these are like the more common ones. And then we'll have uh, a lot of the other ones as well. Um, yeah. And sometimes, like one application can depend on, you know, more than ten dependencies, and it's it's, it's really uh, a hard time for us to even compile that application. Uh, yeah. Um, and then the second difference I think is uh, on the environment management. So. When you're de uh, deploying a web server, you probably just install it one version for everything, right? There's no reason for you to really like install uh, two versions of MySQL, right? Because after all, you're going to be running one instance. But actually, in HPC, um, we usually have to have like different versions of the same library or tool um, because some code may not work with like a higher version of GCC. Uh, maybe they require a old version of a library. So uh, usually we'll have like GCC 4 or 5 or 6 installed and then you have different versions for different libraries. And 
uh, this can also become a nightmare if you simply put everything there. Um, so what happens is that um, uh, there are tools for handling environment. So essentially, uh, there are two common tools. One is called environment module. The other is LMOD. So what it does is that uh, you can say, okay, we have three different versions for the same library, and you can so-called load a version of a library. And what it does is that it changes the uh, like path or LD path accordingly, so that uh, you can use the correct version of the library. And you can like switch. So if you load like version A and then you call switch, it's gonna unload everything from version A and load version B instead. So this avoids a lot of the hassle to uh, manually manage all these paths and writing like scripts and the source them. So so you don't have to do that. Uh, you just prepare some module files and the rest is handled by this. Uh, software and usually if you actually uh, log into a supercomputer uh, you will see that they they all have this this the software here and you can use it to load like all kinds of different uh, libraries or compilers or tools that they have on the bus yeah um, actually uh, and I think the third thing is about Containerization. So this is something that's quite popular, I think. Like we have like DevOps and all that. Um, so things like Docker, Kubernetes. There are. I mean, I think uh, like a lot of more companies are adopting this container approach, so that it's easier to deploy uh, your servers, your services. Um, and it's also very easy to scale. You simply like. If you have a high load, you can just uh, spin up a new server and deploy some kind of uh, containers on them. Mm, but in the HPC space, I think there are currently like experiments with containers. So it's definitely not a norm in HPC. Um, but there are things like, I think, cost shifter. So it's something similar to Docker, I think. Um, and yeah, so it's only very expensive, uh, very uh, experimental support on this uh, because it gets difficult to work in containers when you are trying to um, work together. So like spinning con containers on all the computers, but then you have to let them communicate with each other. So that will become a little bit more difficult compared to simply launching that uh, the application on the server themselves. So. I didn't really dig into this, um, yeah. But yeah, so this is something that's not very normal in HPC. Um, yeah. Also, we don't really need like scaling, uh, as in uh, dynamic scaling, because when you are launching the job, you already specify the number of computing servers that you, that you want, and uh, you don't really need to uh, like reduce or increase the nodes as you're running. So that's not something that we do in HPC. Yeah. So maybe like container doesn't have a very significant uh, uh, like advantage when used in HPC space. And I guess the uh, last difference is that there are a lot of low level tunings for the system. So uh, again, when you deploy a web server, if you use like AWS, you simply choose a system image, and then it's going to be ready. Then essentially, what you're doing is just installing the uh, software and libraries you need. Um, but for uh, HPC cluster, we have to install the OS from scratch. We have to configure a lot of things like how are you going to partition this? Uh, how to configure the network? Uh, and then we even do things like uh, tune the BIOS. So we'll, we'll actually turn off things like hybrid threading, even turbo boost sometimes, uh, like because it's not helpful in HPC, and it may consume more, uh, more power. I mean, we haven't tested, but uh, this is just what we do. 
And um, also you may, oh, sorry, there's a time over. Um, you may do some like kernel parameter tuning. So, so there are a lot of low level tuning involved that helps to really improve the performance, which is very critical in HPC. Yeah. But this is not something that you usually do uh, where you're using the cloud servers. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is uh, automatic deployment. So when I started in 2016, I was the system lead for our team. And actually, at first, uh, we were installing everything by hand. So you know, create a USB uh, bootable drive, and then we have like uh, four servers, so you install on each of them. And then <laughs> during the OS installation, there are so many options that you have to choose by yourself with the mouse. And then um, after you install the system, you have to install a bunch of libraries, uh, software on them, again, manually, everything. So it was very difficult, and it's very tedious and error prone. So sometimes you may miss a critical component on one of the servers, and you may not even realize. So that may lead to some uh, even more severe problems later on. Yeah. So that was mm, so. So back then I was thinking, okay, is there any like solution that I can automate everything? So actually now our deployment uh, process. Uh, utilized uh, these two tools here, which happen to be, uh, I think, Red Hat uh, related tools. So the first is Kickstart. Um, this is to automate the OS installation, so you can write a file and then say, mm, I want to partition the disk this way, I'm going to set up the network this way. So it's really handy. Uh, so now uh, we create a custom iOS, uh, ISO file, so every time we just use that to install. So simply plug in the thumb drive and everything is done uh, by itself. Um, and then once the OS is installed, we use Ansible to configure the uh, softwares and all that. So uh, we do things like install NFS with Ansible, create user accounts, set up the correct permission for different folders, uh, install like monitoring tools, and uh, some common utilities and all that. So pretty much I would say 95% of our deployment is automated. So that's that's pretty easy. Now I can simply, um, like when I get a servers, I can spend like, I mean, I, uh, I just need to wait for like one or two hours for everything to finish. So that was easier on me and I can spend more time doing I mean, preparing the actual applications and all that instead of uh, spending too much time on this uh, system thing. Yeah. So this is uh, the two uh, the, the two utilities that I find very helpful for it. Yeah. So I, I think that's that's all I would uh, that's all I would like to share today. Uh, so we actually have a website and a Twitter account. So if you want to know more about us, you can go to the website uh, for our Twitter. We also have a GitHub organization. So we put um, like our Kickstarter configuration there, our Ansible uh, configuration there, and also the application that we have worked on in the past. So we actually optimize some of the uh, applications and uh, we put our own version. So if you're interested, you can visit our website and So that's all for my presentation. Yeah. yeah, so regarding, so we made the new stuff. So there are some other things available and so forth. So in OpenStack, there is something known as this limit filter. OK. You can try that out. And apart from that, uh, you can use backer as well. But data mostly used for the web devices. I don't know if you can pay for it. Thank you very much.